Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's a pleasure to have John Blitzer with us today and tomorrow and on Friday also. And uh, for those who don't know John well, um, I should say that he did his undergrad work at Cornell with uh, Claire Cardi and Lillian Lee. And then he got his PhD at UPenn uh, under the supervision of Fernando Pereira. And now he's a postdoctoral fellow at UC Berkeley working with uh, Dan Klein. And so huge names in the field, right? Uh, and um, in between uh, UPenn and Berkeley, he uh, went away from pure academic work for a little, and he worked uh, in MSRA. So he already worked in Microsoft. And I should say his uh, main interest lie in the area of, of uh, applied uh, of, of machine learning applied to natural language. And uh, he did a lot of work on, on uh, uh, finding models that, uh, compact models, semantic and, and syntactic, to represent uh, phenomena in languages. Uh, and he'll talk today more about that. Uh, so his talk is natural language processing in multiple dom domains relating the unknown to the known. Uh, and without further ado, John, please. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Silvio. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a few, kind of touch on a few of the applications of kind of this idea of relating the unknown to the known. Um, <coughs> and I hope that, uh, you know, I'll touch on again at, at the very end, kind of other, other ideas that just couldn't make it into this talk that I hope people who are, who are interested in will talk to me about uh, afterward. So. I actually want to start out by talking about um, kind of machine learning for NLP or statistical NLP in uh, what I'll call the standard or, or single domain setting. So in this setting, um, we build our models by training them from a corpus of data. Um, so in this case, I've given, a, I suppose there's an article from Wall Street Journal. And we ask a teacher to go through and label uh, a whole document or pieces of a document for us. So this can be anything from um, annotating a particular sentence with its syntactic structure to um, you know maybe if the teacher is actually a user clicking on ads that that might be you know telling us which ads are relevant for this particular article um, and it might be something extremely complicated and, and with a lot of structure like uh, you know taking uh, a sentence in English and giving its Chinese translation. Um, and in all these cases, our goal here is to build from this an NLP system, which is essentially mimicking the, um, the actions of the teacher, right? So in particular, after we've looked at uh, a bunch of examples, we can take as input now another uh, document, um, in this case, uh, again, from the Wall Street Journal. Um, Ask our NLP, feed it to our NLP system, and get out a bunch of predictions. So, you know, just to use the first thing as an, the first example, uh, you know, we could ask our system to tell us what the best syntactic analysis for this particular sentence would be. And um, so, I won't go so far as to call this a solved problem, but it's typically very well understood in NLP. Um, and uh, one of the you know fundamental reasons for this is that you know we can see that training and prediction are from the same distribution. And because of this, um, empirical process theory actually gives us very strong guarantees and tells us you know, the more, for example, sentences from the Wall Street Journal we see with their parses, if we build a model from that, uh, we expect to do better and better the more data we see. And in fact, this is true um, empirically as well. So you know, if you look at uh, syntactic parsers built on the Wall Street Journal, if you give them another similar Wall Street Journal sentence, they tend to do extremely well. Um, but that's not, not what I'm talking about today. What I'm going to talk about is what I'll call the multi-domain setting. And in this setting, uh, the setup is at, at, at training time is quite similar. Now I've labeled the Wall Street Journal here a, a, what I've called a source um, domain. And the idea now is that 
we want to go through and, in a new target domain, apply our model. So one, one possible scenario is, um, you know, I'm reading the MSDN forums, and I want to know when a particular question is answered. Well, it might be really helpful to parse the sentences in those forums, but of course they look nothing like Wall Street Journal text, right? So I, I run them through my parser and I get out a bunch of predictions, and you know, I can hope for the best, um, but uh, of course, all the nice things that I said in the previous slide uh, are not true anymore, right? So, for example, um, you know, now uh, uh, I come to MSDN forums and people are talking about, uh, you know, SQL queries and race conditions, and that just doesn't happen in financial news, right? And, uh, and because of that sort of, there's no more, you know, at least standard empirical process theory now doesn't have anything to say about this case, right? Because the distribution has changed, and kind of in the limit, I'm, I'm taking a sample from a completely different distribution and asking you to do well. And we have no more guarantees about that we would do well. And in fact, this is true, you know, state-of-the-art models really tend to break down here, uh, sometimes more than doubling an error. So just to, um, I'm gonna start by giving you guys two examples um, at a high level of the two problems that I'm going to talk about uh, today that illustrate this. So the first is motivated from what I'll call sentiment classification. Um, and the idea here is that we get a, a review of a particular product. In this case, this is a product on Amazon. And this is a review of a book and it reads, this book was horrible. I read half, suffering from a headache the entire time and eventually I lit it on fire. One less copy in the world, don't waste your money. I wish I had the time spent reading this book back. It wasted my life. So our goal here as, a, as um, machine learners is to take as input this document and output either positive or unfortunately for this book, I won't keep you guys in suspense, this is actually a negative review. Um, and the, the crucial idea here is just that if we've seen a lot of examples, you know, if we have a teacher who goes through and tells us, you know, oh, this review is positive, this review is negative, uh, we can actually do uh, very well on books reviews. But now, um, you know, books aren't the only thing that's sold, even on Amazon, um, and they're certainly not the only product or service that we'd like to uh, uh, try to understand. And one, um, if I actually try to build a model and we say, oh, well, I'd like to now use, I'd like to now do a good job at um, reviews of other types of products. So in this case, this is a review of a deep fryer. Amazon also sells deep fryers. Um, and this, this reads, uh, I love the way the Teffel deep fryer cooks, however I'm returning my second one due to a defective lid closure. The lid may close initially, but after a few uses it no longer stays closed. I won't be buying this one again. Um, and the, the basic idea here uh, is that if we haven't seen any outputs from a teacher on kitchen appliances, right? we may have many kitchen appliance reviews that we'd like to say is this positive or negative, but our teacher hasn't gone through and told us for any of them whether or not they are. Um, and we'd like to be able to generalize, but in practice um, there is a huge increase in error when training on uh, reviews of books and testing on kitchen appliances. In fact, the error doubles here. And uh, this is, so this uh, particular um, Setup is something that I worked on with Mark Dredzi and Fernando Pereira as part of my PhD thesis. Yeah. The human performance in this test. The human performance. Um, well, that's that's hard to say exactly. Um, so we all of this is crawled from Amazon, and um, you know you can't say for sure. Right? You know what the re, the star. So we're basing this on what the stars the reviewer himself gave. Um, so, and we have a little bit of inner annotator, but the inner annotator is basically just me and Mark looking at a review and trying to decide, right? So, and that seems to be um, 90 and above uh, for, for all of the separate domains. Actually, it's a little better outside of books. Books tend to have higher variance. Um, but, um, but again, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't really call this a strict inner annotator experiment that's very off the cuff, right? We really just have the stars and we're trying to you know, reproduce whether or not, kind of look at a review and reproduce the, the, whether or not it got, let's say, five stars, right? Um, okay, so the second problem that I'm gonna talk to you about is motivated from web search across multiple languages. So uh, 
if I do a search on um, a Chinese search engine for Xiaonei, which is actually the top social networking site in China, um, of course I, get, I actually get back very good results. So the first is, so this is a kind of locational query and uh, Let's see if, okay, that's not the right button. Okay, so um, there, uh, in, in practice, this is, this is exactly the right link. And, you know, the second hit is actually a, uh, a mobile version of this site. And it's also, you know, also a great result for this query. But there are many, and so this is, this is a, a common one of the, you know, one of the top queries you see in any Chinese search engine. Um, but there are many queries um, like this one, this, this is Shaman Shijun, which is the Chinese translation of, of Salmonilla. And um, the top two results are okay. Right? So uh, the first one is um, kind of the Chinese version of Wikipedia, and the second one is this community question answer forum where someone asked, what is Salmonilla? And someone responded and said, you know, gave, basically gave a description of the disease. But really, if you think about it, what you might be looking for at at a high level, if you type in Salmonella, is kind of, well, respected sites, government sites. There's, there is a CDC in China, um, and they do have a website on Salmonella, but it's not here. Um, you know, or you might want uh, you know, news about Salmonella outbreaks. None of that's there. Um, and the, the key insight, though, is so um, th this is something that I worked on at, at MSRA with Wei Gao, who was an intern there. Um, and Ming Zhou and Kam Fai Wang. And uh, they, so uh, the key insight though here, um, so actually there is, there is a significant loss in, um, in ranking performance here, and we'll, we'll get to that later on. Um, the key insight though here is that in English, actually, if I search for Salmonella, I kind of get exactly what I'm hoping for. At the top head is the CDC, and then there's some news results. Um, and um, the, the, basic, uh, the basic idea here, though, is that these results, which actually are kind of low if you look at purely Chinese, the Chinese ranker, um, actually are quite high uh, if you were able to know that these queries were equivalent and ranked purely um, based on uh, the English ranker, the English um, results. And, I mean, just to give a high level, certain... Um, Certain features, the reason for this, this disparity is one is just that, you know, in particular for a, a search engine like Bing, just a lot more effort has gone into the English ranker, right? But there are other things too, like, for example, um, click through data just is less meaningful in Chinese because there's less click through. And uh, um, there's, uh, you know, static, uh, static, static ranking features like page rank are. Um, not as predictive in, in Chinese as they are in English. So there's kind of this, this features which may have been reliable in English directly are no longer as reliable in, in Chinese. Um, and the rankers kind of suffer because of that. And that's, that's kind of one, um, uh, one problem we're going to try to overcome by exploiting a ranker that we already know, right? The English ranker we know is good. Okay. So, um, the, so as you might have guessed, the talk is going to break down. The first part is going to be about uh, known and relating known and unknown features. And for this case, we're going to be looking at building a shared representation um, for different documents. And the second is going to be about known and, I'm sorry, shared, and, uh, shared representation across different products and reviews. The second is going to be about known and unknown documents. So um, in this case, uh, I may have uh, a review, uh, a, uh, a query in Chinese, which I don't know how to do good ranking for, but I have a corresponding query in English. And again, I need to some, uh, I'm going to try to exploit cross-lingual structure to do a better job ranking in Chinese. Okay. So, um, so okay, so, sorry. Uh, the, uh, the first thing I want to mention, though, is that in order to build this shared representation, I want to note first of what's different. So um, I've highlighted here in blue and in red words that are pretty predictive but are kind of unique to a particular domain. So in this case, um, you know, I can read half of a book, 
And I know that's, that's negative, but I'm not going to read half of a kitchen appliance. I'm not going to read half of a deep fryer. And similarly, uh, deep fryers, when they don't work, I don't like them. And, I, and if I return them, I probably don't like it either. But I'm not going to say, you know, this book is defective. Uh, it just doesn't work. And I'm returning it, right? That's a, this is not what you say to be negative about books. Um, and the idea here is just that these unique words, I'm, I'm going to look for a representation, and I'll, I'll discuss in detail what that representation looks like in a minute, that um, maps returning and lit it on fire to similar areas of a, a low dimensional space. And I'm going to try to exploit that to do better uh, sentiment prediction. Okay, so I, I want to begin with a brief interlude, and actually this is probably not necessary for this audience, but at least to get us on the same page notationally, the kinds of models that I'm going to be looking at um, here are what's called conditional exponential families models. Basically the idea is that each um, review I'm going to score as the dot product of a feature vector and a weight vector. Now the feature vector in this case is going to be very simple. It's going to be just the bag of words, bigrams, and trigrams. And what this means is that, well, I might have, uh, so it's going to be very high dimensional. Each dimension in my feature vector corresponds to a single word or bigram. So it'll be millions of dimensions, but any particular document will be quite sparse. So for example, if the word excellent occurs, um, uh, it, it, three times, then I give it a three in my feature vector. Great would get a value of one in my feature vector if it occurs once. Fascinating two if it occurs twice. Right? And similarly, the, uh, the parameter vector is also high dimensional. And each entry in this parameter vector basically corresponds to the propensity of a particular word or bigram to indicate positivity or negativity. So for example, um, the, I might say that you know, excellent has a weight of one, um, you know, great has a weight of two, and so on. And taking the dot product of them gives me roughly a score that will indicate whether or not this is positive or negative. So in this case, looking at the dot product, it's three plus two plus um, 2.4, which is 7.4, and I say, okay, this, this uh, is a positive um, review. And the only thing that I, I want to actually bring up, though, is that in terms of this particular model, this linear models paradigm, um, the thing that we're concerned with is words that have zeros in our parameter vector, right? So if I build a model on books and I come to a word that's, you know, like sturdy, I've never seen sturdy used to describe a book before, then I don't really know whether this is positive or negative. Although, you know, as humans, kind of, we know that uh, that sturdy is a positive word for kitchen appliances. Yeah. Would you really think that? I mean, once in a while, someone's going to say this sturdy prose reminds me of. It's like, do you have that many real zeros? I and mean, if you have enough corpus, you might even words where a word is really common, like sturdy or reliable or or you know on fire. Um, you follow me? Uh, it seems like you might have the words show up, but just very rarely in a different context. Yeah, um, I, I think that's I think that's a fair characterization. There are always there's kind of um, you know in language there are always these heavy tail phenomena, and in particular in in reviews, people tend to take creative license. So you're actually I mean Amazon has a lot of reviews, so you know hundreds of thousands, and they're still going to be kind of. Uh, uh, Hapox legumina, like words that appear only once, that uh, that actually are still uh, are still there. Um, but um, but you're right that like there, there a lot of you know words like sturdy um, probably is not a fair characterization of things that uh, that uh, that are unique. But but even low frequency things are, are are actually not. It's not exactly clear once you have a million how to attribute particular weight to something that's seen only once or only twice, right? Um, so, um, so okay. Uh, so all right, so let's, uh, let's back up for a second and, and see exactly what the setup is. So I have words that are like fascinating and boring that are unique to books and defective and sturdy that are unique or almost unique to kitchen appliances. And 
what I basically, um, my, the thing that I want to point out though is that I also have words and phrases that are shared across the two domains, right? So I can say that uh, a book is fantastic and a blender is fantastic, and both of these are ways of expressing positivity about books and blenders. Similarly, I can say a book is a waste of money and uh, you know, a deep fryer is a waste of money, and both of these uh, can be used to describe uh, books and deep fryers. So I'm going to, the representation I'm going to focus on is a real valued representation. And what I'm going to do is use these uh, words, these purple words here, to link up words that are unique to each domain. So the idea is that a word like fascinating can be linked to a word like sturdy via the bigram highly recommended. And similarly, um, a word like boring can be linked to the word uh, defective via the phrase waste of money. And the idea is that we're going to use these to map these other domain unique words to similar areas of the low dimensional space. Okay. So um, this, again, this is part of my uh, thesis, and I called these pivot words, or more generally for across all problems, pivot features. Um, and uh, this is, again, work that I did with uh, Fernando Pereira and other grad students at Penn. Okay, so how are we going to actually exploit these pivots? Well, one thing we can say is that, well, actually, if we've seen um, a pivot before, you know, I come to a document where I see the phrase, do not buy. And even if it's a kitchen appliance, I, can, I know that I've seen do not buy this book. And I can still do a good job here. right? And similarly, if I've seen an absolutely great purchase, well, this indicates that this should be positive. Um, so I don't actually need to exploit any unique information here when I do have the pivot words. It's the cases where someone says, oh, this is a sturdy deep fryer, but I've never seen the word sturdy before in, in books reviews. And what I'm actually going to try to do here is that uh, if I notice if I expand the particulars of a, of a review, I can see that actually I get things like do not buy the shark portable steamer, the trigger mechanism is defective. And, and, I can, and uh, similarly, if I see an absolutely great purchase, this blender is incredibly sturdy. So I notice that these um, particular domain specific words are actually uh, do actually co-occur with the unique words. Right? So in particular here, um, how, am I, how am I going to try to exploit this? Well, one thing I can do is say, I'd like to predict the presence of a particular pivot. Um, so I'd say, I want to predict whether or not great appears in this document using all the other words in this document as context. Right? So, in particular, um, I've written here another exponential families model. The feature vector is the same. Um, of course, I'm going to delete the word great from the feature vector. The weight vector now, um, I've, uh, I have, I've replaced theta with this w parameter here. And w is, is basically <laughs> unique to each pivot. Right? So um, in particular, I have a separate weight I want to predict separately for each pivot whether or not it appears in this document. And the thing to notice is that, well, if sturdy appears a lot of times with great, then it's going to get high weight kind of automatically at an intuitive level. And um, because of this, I, I should be able to say, you know, well, kind of the, the high level intuition is sturdy it co occurs with great, and great co occurs, and great is a good positive predictor, so maybe sturdy should be as well. Right? And the last thing I want to say is that I showed you kind of five example pivots. In fact, we can construct these automatically from, um, from unlabeled books and kitchen appliance reviews. Yeah? Um, so the phrase not by contains by, and my phrase does not work well if it contains the phrase work well. So yeah. how do you deal with Yeah, that's right. So you're, you're right that you have to be careful when constructing these predictors. Um, and I want to go through exact, so exactly how, um, how we construct the final representation, and then maybe come back to that question afterward. Yeah, Chris? So if a rare word never co-occurs with one of these pivots, yeah. are you sunk to that particular word? Presumably you are, right? Yeah, you're right. Um, 
And that's why, in particular, that's why you, um, it's kind of always better to, cons to use more and more pivots, right? The more you can get your hands on, the better. Um, on the other hand, uh, there are situations, um, and I, I won't talk about it here, but there are situations where um, you can imagine kind of um, completely disjoint areas of feature space, right? Where, uh, you know, there is just nothing you can do, right? Maybe there's a set of kitchen appliances where no one ever uses anything in common with books, right? Um, and, and, and in practice, kind of this is something that at least, uh, at least um, in theory happens. Now, I've never seen it empirically, but, um, but you know, there, there certainly is the case that, uh, that you might just be, you know, you might just not be able to do perfectly on, on kitchen appliance reviews. Do you have a feel for the fraction of times this occurs in the, in the data? Um, so in our experience, it, let's see, I, I have done this experiment. There is, the experiments are in my thesis, but it's, it's, it's certainly below 5% of the, of the instances, right? And, and the idea is just that, like, you know, if you construct enough of these pivots, you might still get the, the uh, review wrong, right? So these, kind, these are kind of cartoon pictures, and there are many reasons why you could get a review wrong. Um, but, but in general, um, just co-occurrence does, if you select enough pivots, you know, 5,000 or 10,000, eventually you can saturate almost all of this space. So, okay, so, yeah. Why do you need the discrete notion of pivot if you could just look at the conditional distribution? Yeah. So you condition on the class and just look at the entire dictionary and then you automatically just have a notion of pivotness for a given word and you don't need to have a cutoff for certain things being pivots or not pivots. Yeah, that's 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 right. Um, it's it's mainly for computational reasons. Um, so you'll see that uh, I'll want to train a bunch of pivot predictors, and it's easier to train, uh, you know, five thousand than it is to train five million. Um, you can use the feature selection. In yeah, system. and in fact, that's the way we act. That's a that's a good question. I'll answer that. That's the way we actually do it. Um, you know, we you can train, for example, um, an L one regularized predictor. You get out a sparse predictor. And this sparse predictor, you take the, um, the active features and use those as pivots, right? So that's, that's one example that tends to work well. Um, OK, so I've trained up these, these uh, predictors. And maybe there are uh, you know, 5,000 of them. And if I can write down a matrix here, a uh, big W, where each kind of column in the matrix corresponds to a single predictor. So for example, maybe this column is the predictor for highly recommended, right? Whether or not highly recommended appears. And the reason I want to write it down this way in particular is that um, I can actually predict using this weight vector the presence of all the pivots in a particular document, right? So I see a document, I want to predict what's, what's the chance that highly recommended appears, that horrible appears, that great appears, and so on for all of the different pivots, right? Um, and, and at a high level, we're almost done here, right? So if I have 5,000 pivots, I can generate a representation which is essentially 5,000 new features, each of which is a prediction about something that I know is shared with my source domain. Okay. Um, and because of that, um, this is kind of, uh, th this in particular uh, almost answers our question, right? And the reason I say it doesn't is that actually related to your question, a lot of the uh, predictors are going to capture kind of information that we don't quite want, right? Non, what I'll call non-sentiment information, right? So uh, one example, um, it, you know, not buy is a good example, but um, here, here's another one. I could say, well, I've, I've written a kind of cartoon picture here where each uh, axis is uh, corresponds to a single pivot, and each of these points is kind of the weight of a feature. Um, for that particular, in that particular pivots predictor, right? So one of the uh, high weight features for highly recommend will be the word I, right? So when you highly recommend, when someone highly recommends something, they usually say, I highly recommend this book, right? But of course, the word I has nothing to do with um, sentiment in, in particular, right? It's, it's a purely syntactic phenomenon. And uh, what I want to be able to do here is somehow distill from this uh, the, the correct um, 
representation for actually predicting sentiment, right? And the idea is that, well, there are words like I, and there may be even a lot of words like I, but there are so, still some like wonderful which are predictive of both highly recommend and great. And so what I'm gonna look for is a, a subspace of best fit to the space whose columns, uh, who, with the space which is spanned by the columns of the matrix W, right? So the idea is that this is kind of the best low dimensional subspace in terms of uh, the error to the full pivot predictor space. And you can think of this as almost a kind of denoising, right? Where I want, the, the subspace will capture what I want from sentiment and uh, kind of these syntactic phenomenon which aren't shared across many pivots um, will not be in the top, uh, the top um, eigenvectors of W. So, uh, uh, well, WW transpose, the top singular vectors of W. Right, so in th this is in practice what we do. This, um, this psi here is actually just the projection onto the top sing left singular vectors of W or the top uh, eigenvectors of WW transpose. Right? And this is kind of um, in a uh, squared law sense the best subspace um, for the space of pivot predictors or the space of natural parameters for all of these different um, uh, conditional exponential families. Okay. W has not, knows nothing about um, sentiment. I mean, I could be creating a classifier on, I don't know, uh, you know, overuse of long vocabulary words or something, right? That's right, yeah. So W, I mean, remember that, uh, remember though that, um, so it's not quite true that W knows nothing about sentiment because we select the pivots in a particular way, oh. right? So um, as, I guess as, as Misha asked, like one question might be, how do I, I want to predict, you know, I, I train a classifier to predict on the source domain, right? For books, I know what I'm looking for, right? And I can use that to bias what I consider to be a pivot, right? Um, and in fact, I bias it in two ways. This is actually crucial for the structure of W. One way is I bias it to be predictive of the target Classify, classification I'm trying to do, which is sentiment. And I can do that by looking at the source label data. And the other is I make sure that the pivots are shared, right? And I can do that just by looking at data from both domains and saying, well, you're not a pivot unless you're, you occur in both source and target documents, right? But I, your question actually is, it, um, is right. So that, that does, that's intuitively why it's true. It turns out that um, in order to um, kind of prove that this will work, uh, th that a, a method like this will work, there's a, there's a lot of subtleties in kind of the structure of W. So, it, I mean, um, it's, it's actually uh, a problem that I'm uh, working on right now, but I think it's like in order to kind of characterize when this will work, there are actually a lot of subtleties in the structure of the distribution and how, you can, and how W is constructed. So, okay. Um, so, Psi actually is our low dimensional representation. And in particular here, um, I'm looking at psi, uh, psi times uh, x for a particular doc input document x. And the thing to notice is that this actually does map from the high dimensional feature space into a low dimensional shared space, precisely because we forced w to have that structure. Right? And these are the top eigenvectors of w. And so the only thing now left to tell you is how I train my final model, right? So before I was constructing my features from words and bigrams, now I'm gonna construct it from the projection of this document onto the low dimensional shared subspace. Um, and, uh, and basically the, uh, the idea here uh, is that, you know, by constructing features for on the projection, um, I'm going to have something that generalizes across domains. Okay. All right, so I want to uh, show you guys briefly some, um, some results. So here I, I lied, I actually have more than two domains. I kind of crawled all the different categories of Amazon and we have uh, reviews from several different kinds of products. So the, what I'm showing you here is 
what's the accuracy on reviews of kitchen appliances when I train on reviews from all these other separate domains? Right. So um, the first gold bar here is kind of our gold standard. If we actually had a lot of kitchen appliance reviews to train on, how well could we do? Um, and uh, in this case, uh, so this is 87.7. Um, if, if we now train up a support vector machine just looking at each of these domains separately, um, we get the following set of, uh, set of predictions. Um, and the only thing that's uh, interesting um, here is just that you know, electronics reviews tend to use a lot of the same language as reviews of kitchen appliances, so you can do a lot better training on those. Um, the, the last piece, the last set of uh, results here is you know, the, the method I just described, where I train instead of on the high dimensional uh, unigram and bigram uh, feature vector, I now use the proje its projection onto this shared subspace. Um, and in fact, uh, you do see a big improvement, even for electronics, um, but certainly for DVDs and books. And the, um, in general, if you look at kind of all the pairs of domains um, across all the data that I have, you can close this gap by about 36% between the green and the gold bars, sort of adaptation and what you could do if you had in-domain data using this technique. Mm -hmm. Did you try combining the, the other yeah, the books and the, and, the, and the electronics and DVD. I did try that, um, but and see if you can sometimes improve its own results off. Of, you know, yeah, because you get more data. Right. Um, so I did try that. I don't have a slide for it. Um, and you're right that you can. Of course, um, there is kind of a, a, a ceiling there yeah, that so um, to think of it coarsely in terms of bias and variance. Each, the predictor that you learn for books is biased with respect to the Bayes optimal predictor for a kitchen, right? So um, no matter, if I saw an infinite number of books reviews, I still won't be able to accurately predict kitchen appliances or as accurately. And there is kind of a, a, a point after which it's no, like after I see some number of kitchen appliance reviews, um, you just can't do any better no matter how many books reviews you add, right? The question is, do you already have it on first kitchen appliance reviews, so you can't? I mean, you might no, well, so small that they, uh, they if I crawled now, I might. Um, at the time, which is two years ago, kitchen, Amazon just didn't have very many kitchen appliances reviews, and you could still do better because, you know, there, there are literally like, you know, even in 2007, I'm sure there are more now, we crawled millions of books reviews. Right, so but at kitchen appliance reviews, we only had like ten thousand, right? So you still run into this, yeah. So that um, stars um, to a binary classification. Yeah. So how do you do that's five stars usually, right? So that's right. How do you do how did you make that split? Uh, well, we threw out in this experiment, we threw out threes. So it turns out that you can actually treat this as a regression problem, um, and you know either either kind of an ordinal regression or actual uh, looking, you know, considering these to be real valued predictions. And the same, the same sort of uh, projection into a low dimensional subspace also works well um, for those. Yeah? So I think it, this is like following up a little bit on Robert's question. I, uh -huh. I think what, what you can also show though is that in practice if you just combine more and more domains and you have one held out domain, you know, the more domains you combine, the better you get on the held out domain until you pretty much reach the same results, so very similar results to, to stretch or correspondence learning. So if you throw in, you know, on kitchen appliances, if you throw in, in all of the electronics, electronic data you have, the book data you have, throw in the movie data set from Tang and Lee and the, uh, the DVDs, you know, you, you actually, I mean, you get, you get close to, to which is, you know, it's a brute force approach. It's just like, let's use all the data that we have from all the domains that we have. And if we have the luxury of having an assortment of domains right. where we have labeled data, which is not the case in all, you know, domain adaptation problems. But in that case, you can actually do fairly well. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, like, that depends, again, on the structure of the particular domains, right? So as long as, I mean, so there actually are theoretical results that if, you know, a, let's say kitchen is kind of a mixture of electronics and DVDs or something, then you can do perfectly, right? Um, but if there's any sort of 
um, unique part of kitchen appliances, then you're always going to miss something. Um, so um, yeah, you're right, um, and kind of it, it depends on the structure of these these domains. Yeah. Can I say a couple of words about how do you quantify those distributional differences? Uh, yeah, let me do my last slide of this section, and then uh, and then I'll tell you. So okay, so the last thing I want to give is some intuition for this. Um, a low dimensional subspace. And what I'm showing here is in the top left, words that are unique to books but um, are negative under this pro single projection. So this are things like number of pages if you, if you, so when I say projection, sorry, I'm showing you one uh, row of the matrix psi, which is kind of a linear projection from the space of features onto the real line. And um, here, what I'm showing is, so if I mention the plot of a book, I probably don't like it. Um, nobody likes books that are predictable. If I say it had you know, 586 pages, it probably means I'm you know, starting a diatribe about uh, how, how long and boring it was. Um, similarly, uh, if I, you know, for kitchen appliances, you know, uh, these are words that are, don't occur at all in books. Um, so if I didn't train on kitchen appliances, I wouldn't be able to get them. But, they still are negative under this projection, like words like the plastic or poorly designed. Um, and the, these, are, these are words that are unique to kitchen appliances. So here are positive words, um, fascinating, engaging, must read. Uh, a little embarrassingly, uh, the most positive, unique word for books is Grisham. Um, and people just tend to love, uh, love John Grisham novels on Amazon. Maybe you should make a point. Yeah. Well, OK. So this. Uh, uh, actually, um, if for appliances, you see things like, oh, I've been using this for years now. Uh, this deep fryer is a breeze. Um, espresso. So espresso turns out to be the John Grisham of kitchen appliances. Basically, everyone just likes espresso machines. Um, and you know, people, when they write about espresso machines, just tend to give them high reviews. I guess you paid a lot for an espresso machine, and you're like, oh, it must be good. You said these are words that didn't show up at all. I still wonder there wouldn't be some things like, like you know, that where you the meaning changes or the words very okay. in one or the other. Uh, you know, things like well, even things like number of pages. Maybe I like lots of pages in, 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 in when it comes to the manuals for my electronic appliances, and I hate the fact that you know if I mention that, that's a good thing. Okay, so I think if I could tease out the separate questions, the one was your first question, which is, is there ever a word which is truly unique? Well, no, and uh, and so in this case, like for the data set, we have. These are like the you know the bigram poorly designed isn't isn't in the books domain. But that's not to say that you know now if I crawled Amazon, you know I wouldn't see the you know the character was poorly designed and so, something like that. So so I, I agree with you that you know there's always this question. On the other hand, you know the more data I see, kind of the more bigrams I have, and you can imagine a non-parametric version of this where I basically increase the length of the n-gram with the amount of data I have. Um, words that were unique that already has showed up, but the meaning of them wasn't quite properly right. incorporated in your, in your training. So, so you're right. This does happen. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. It might not be something like number of pages, but it's something like you know, cell phones. It's really nice to be small, but it's not really good for hotel rooms to be small. Um, and and uh, that's, so in general, that turns out to be extremely hard to deal with, um, sort of in the most general setting. Uh, if I don't have any labeled data from kitchen appliance reviews, and I have kind of arbitrary polarity switching of features, then I'm basically host. There's nothing I can do. Um, but book reviews, and they just happen to all be negative or positive. But that's not very much evidence. So right. I notice that you can say, well, gosh, espresso shows up a lot in this new corpus, and I only had a few bits of information. So it seems like this hard edge thing. Oh, it doesn't show up. It does show up. It doesn't seem like. It seems fragile. Um, well, I mean, that's one reason I'm trying to separate the qualitative and quantitative results, right? I don't actually exploit the hard edge thing in the quantitative section, right? So there's sort of this, these are these are the classification performance, and it doesn't matter whether or not a word showed up zero, one, ten, you know, five hundred times. That's just what the results are. And and but you're right for these qualitative results, all these things are unique. So yeah, but. You're right. That that phenomenon is, is true, um, and and uh, and you know, uh, it, it doesn't seem to affect us too much empirically here. But 
Um, I could I could certainly in, envision places where it would. Yeah. Uh, if you go back a page, um, there, yeah. um, these results might smell a little bit like also a side effect purely of dimensionality reduction, not your yeah. clever thing. What happens if you do LSI with the same number of dimensions of V? You get sort of any comparable lift. Uh, you get lift. You get lift. Absolutely, but you don't get comparable lift. Um, it's sort of. Uh, Again, um, that uh, either LSI or PLSI or some variant of that was in my thesis. But um, uh, in general, kind of if you don't do, uh, if you don't somehow control the structure of W, or in particular, if you use uh, the the just the instances directly, um, you get kind of you know halfway between these two. Um, You made a passing reference to the cost of the item affecting the reviews. I remember from Michael Gammon's book that uh -huh. car reviews tended to be more positive than negative. Uh, have you tried training across car, you know, a cheap domain versus, you know, books versus like cars? No, I haven't tried that. That's interesting. Um, I, I actually, uh, I, that really was a passing reference. I actually don't know, I don't have any statistics on that phenomenon. That's interesting. Yeah. I've never tried that. I mean, it's a good. I think it's a great point, but. Um, yeah, that, I, 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 I couldn't say. I mean, it, it seems intuitive that uh, that would be true. Um, and of course, again, like, without knowing uh, a priori, kind of what the distribution. So, just to say at a high level, kind of, I guess is to answer Misha's question, at a high level, kind of the 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 constraints you need on the structure of your distribution. Um, fall into uh, what's often called covariate shift, um, this, uh, which basically means that you can control, if you think about a joint distribution on x and y, and looking at um, the performance of a conditional model y given x, um, you basically assume that the conditional on y, and, and by extension the marginal on y, is the same across domains. So once you start playing with that, um, you know you really need some extra information beyond just uh, you know I see some unlabeled data, right? Because you can think of kind of an adversarial setting where you get to do whatever you want on the books domain and as much unlabeled kitchen appliance domain as you have, and then I get to look at your predictor and change change the output of my classifier, right? You're, there's nothing you can do. Um, so, but, but I mean, like, if, if you know kind of some relationship, you can constrain your model using that. Yeah? So I'm wondering how the subspace sign changes according to the, the rating. I, I guess, uh -huh. kind of follow up to my, my last question and, and Robin's last question, but, you know, the changing the meaning of words. Yeah. I mean, so, for example, um, the bigram not work contains the, the, the single gram work. Right. So if you have both of these on your axes, yeah. then for a negative review, then you, you will see both. Right. right? So, so the, the axis, if you were to just train on or just find the, the subspace on negative reviews, you would see this x equal to y line. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's a positive review, then you would probably just see work. So you just get this yeah. you know, y equal to zero line. Um, but if you kind of put those two together and find the subspace that tries to, you know, like work for both kinds of reviews, and you find something yeah. in the middle. And I wonder, I mean, on the one hand, subspace projection kind of gets rid of noise because it, you know, projects things. But on the other hand, it also blurs the differences. Yeah. And I'm wondering, like, what's your insight on um, the effect of putting learning the same subspace for all different scores, which is what you're doing, right? Yes, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Subspaces across domains, but for all scores. For all and scores, you're yeah. that the subspace is, is the same. That's right, yeah. Um, so I guess I'll answer that in two ways. So first, this is a good question. Um, and in, in, in detail, we actually do handle that, um, explit that case explicitly. We look at the bigram, and we don't allow you to use its unigrams to predict it. Right? So for that particular, and that actually does make a difference. You can still do well without it, but, but it, it does make a difference in the final performance. Um, the second is that uh, 
kind of, um, you know, for all these, we can't, we can't deal with everything that way, right? So you can deal with that, but you can't really deal with I and highly recommend, for example, right? Because the, there's sort of certain things that, that you, um, you know, that, that are just uh, difficult to deal with in general. You always expect some correlation. And that's, that's kind of where, um, where the projection helps. Now, for the washing out, um, remember that we learn, the idea is that we learn separate um, weights for each of the projection, uh, you know, e each dimension of the projection, right? So it's linear in the projected subspace. But that means that, you know, there are many, many uh, dimensions which actually aren't predictive at all. Um, I showed you one that is, but there are plenty which are just um, dumb or distinguished between topics in, in books domain, right? Religious books versus sci-fi books, for example, is, is one. And that's not useful for sentiment, um, but that's okay because as long as there's continuity across domains, um, we can learn that from just looking at labeled books data, right? You look at a books domain and you see, oh, well, this thing isn't very predictive, um, and, uh, and therefore I just don't assign it any weight in my, in my predictor. Yeah. You said you have a feature for don't work and another feature for work. Right. And you don't populate both. Right. So suppose, yeah. So in so predict. That seems to be useful, but that seems like it should solve that problem. It solves that problem. Yeah. But there are other, but there are other kind of um, subtle problems where you know, uh, just just kind of general syntactic phenomena, right? Like oh. You know, I, I guess I highly recommend is, is something where, you know, we might not have the trigram I highly recommend in there. But, uh, you know, you still don't, you really would wish that you could say, oh, well, never predict highly recommend using I. It seems like if it turns out that people using the personal pronoun tend to be giving positive reviews, that that's perfectly reasonable. Because our brain thinks, oh, that's not right. But if you're discovering that fact. Yeah, that's true. Um, and, uh, and, um, it turns out for that one that it, it, it you know, like I say, you know, I, I hate this, and so I actually isn't. But, uh, but yeah, uh, that, that actually is a real noise case. But you're right, sometimes that happens. And, and part of the reason is that, you know, you just gotta, uh, you've just, um, you know, you build, a mo you build as much intuitive structure as you can into the model, and, uh, and um, you know, kind of empirically, See whether it works or not. Um, that's just, you know, there you can't characterize, you know, all, all of all of uh, human language kind of in your, the structure of your model. Um, that's, so, so actually, there is another half to the talk, but maybe, uh, uh, maybe I. I would say maybe we should save some questions for the end because. So how much how much time is left? Uh, Five minutes hour. or oh yeah. half hour. But it's half hour of your presentation and the question. So it's good to be interactive, but I don't know how. Uh, so over, well, OK. OK. Yeah, so I'm going to, I'll, I'll finish this. I'll, I'll, the, the next half, it's not actually half. It's more like uh, you know, next third of the talk. So um, manage the time, you know. It's, it's till uh, 11, is that right? Uh, until 10.45. 10. Until 12. Oh. Sorry, till 12, yeah. Uh, OK, so the next part of the talk is going to be about um, you know, uh, projecting information across languages for web search. So OK, so I have, um, I have my two queries, right? Salmonella and uh, Shaman Shijun. And I have, with that, um, you know, a bunch of English and Chinese documents that I've retrieved. And I have this actually for many, many queries, right? So all, all the, I'll, I'll, I'll explain in a bit how I get them. But you know, another one might be British history and yingguo um, lishi. And the basic idea here is that I want to, uh, I, I have, so I have not only, in addition to that, you can almost think of it as I have my ranker's output for the English as well, right? So I know actually how to rank the English documents. And my goal here, so, so in the, I guess in this case, uh, you know, where I write E1, I mean this is the best English document. Where I write E2, this is the second best for that particular query. Now, what I don't know, though, is how to rank the Chinese documents. Right? This is what I want to output. I want to say, oh, well, 
you know, the, the kind of first document in my unordered list is actually rank 15 and, and so on. Right? This is what I want to, what I want to output. And um, for those of you who know, I guess people are roughly familiar with cross-lingual IR. Is that um, people kind of know the setup here? So the, the setup in cross-lingual IR is kind of, I see a Chinese query. I want to rank Chinese and English documents. For the English documents that rank high, I want to translate them back into Chinese and show you Chinese output, right? And the reason kind of I'm, I'm trying to avoid this is, um, I guess with all due respect to people who work on machine translation, we're not quite there yet, um, right? And I, I, I want to say that right now, we can still give you a better ranking, purely monolingual ranking, um, for the Chinese documents uh, without ever showing you translated English output, right? And I want to emphasize that. Uh, the user never has to kind of deal with machine translated output uh, yet. Um, OK. So, all right, so one question you might ask is, well, OK, you know, you're going to do this for bilingual queries, but how many queries are really bilingual? And um, so there are kind of at least two kinds of phenomena that we can't deal with. So uh, um, one is phenomena like uh, which is uh, you know, the Chinese you know, translation of overview of learning to rank. Right? And, and you might say, well, OK, if I had a really good dictionary, I should be able to look this up, and English should help me out here. But the real truth is uh, you know, we can't get this just because you know, um, it, it's, it's not common enough, and we can't really identify that this Chinese query corresponds to an English query, which we could do really well on. Um, so the second is kind of um, the, uh, the opposite, where I can actually translate it, right? Like, so for this query, Chang Hong Dian Shi Ji, which is like the, Chang Hong is probably one of the biggest electronics makers in, in China. And um, you know, I can translate this fine into Changhong TV set, but if I search for this in English, uh, it's not going to be very helpful for ranking the Chinese queries, right? So well, all we do here is actually something really simple. We take an automatically mined dictionary and we uh, threshold the query logs at some number, and then we just look things up there. And it turns out that um, you know, not a, not a huge number, but a significant number. So here, in this case, for the Chinese query log, 2.3% uh, of the queries are actually in the English query log. And, and there are many like this one, which you know, we hope we could get eventually, like overview of learning to rank. Um, but we can't get yet, right? We could get it if we had better machine translation, maybe. Yeah? Do you need to buy by volume? Yeah. Oh, say that again? Do you need queries or by volume? Um, this is, I think, by volume. Um, I'm not. I am not 100% sure. Uh, so, um, okay. So, in order to train and test, I'm, I guess I'll go through this pretty quickly. So, um, okay. So, at training time, I actually am going to see a few. Uh, I'm going to see some bilingual queries. I'm going to get uh, both the English and Chinese ranking. Um, and my goal here now, uh, there's going to be kind of uh, several steps. I want to take this and construct a ranking on pairs of documents, right? So initially I had two rankings, monolingual rankings, now I'm going to construct a kind of bilingual ranking on pairs. And uh, from that, I'm going to learn a ranking function for these pairs. Um, and this will use kind of standard um, uh, machine learning techniques. And now when I see a new query, a new bilingual query, um, I will run this through my ranking function, get out uh, my hypothesized ranking on pairs, and now I need to convert the Chinese side back into a monolingual ranking on Chinese documents. Okay. So, it, so basically, there are kind of these three steps, constructing a joint ranking from monolingual rankings, uh, learning a ranking function on pairs, and reconstructing the monolingual ranking from the bilingual rankings. Um, OK, so constructing the bilingual ranking actually turns out to be quite simple. Um, I mean, there, there are many ways you could consider doing it. Here we force that the bilingual ranking be absolutely consistent with the monolingual ranking. So what I mean by that is that I only rank a pair 
English, English 1, Chinese 1 higher than English 2, Chinese 2, if English 1 is higher than English 2 and Chinese 1 is no lower than Chinese 2, or vice versa. Right? So what I have here is then I can look at a monolingual ranking, construct a bilingual ranking which is consistent with that. Um, and the second thing I need to do is learn this joint ranking function. Um, and this we use a, a standard um, rank SVM style objective. So basically here when I, when I write this, um, I, I want to look at all, for a particular query, I want to look at all pairs of, you know, bilingual pairs. Um, and uh, if <clears throat> I introduce basically a, a hinge loss um, penalty for each one that's ranked, each pair that's ranked incorrectly. And uh, again, I have a feature vector on pairs of documents and their query. Okay. So this is, a, this is you know, a pretty standard setup. Um, the only interesting thing is kind of what features I can introduce now that I have pairs. Right? So I, I have all the uh, standard features, and I'm sure you guys know much more about what those are monolingually than, than I do. Um, that's kind of top secret. They don't let visiting, visiting researchers know that. Um, but uh, but so um, one thing you can introduce is just bilingual dictionary similarity and machine translation and kind of weighted versions of these two, um, as well as URL similarity. Right. So I might say, oh well, you know, Airbus.com and Airbus.com.cn are kind of uh, similar, and um, I can introduce all these features kind of that are. Um, generated from the pair rather than from any single monolingual document. <clears throat> and really, this is what we expect to help us, right? This is kind of uh, what we hope will actually improve uh, performance. So um, the final thing is, how do I convert? So I, I can build a, a now a new ranking on these pairs. And um, I've, I've written here kind of on the left again, what the, when I write EC1, I mean this is the best pair for according to my ranking uh, function. And now um, I see a Chinese document and I say, OK, well, what's the, um, you know, where should I insert this Chinese document in my final Chinese ranking? Right? So in this case, maybe it's occurred in position 1 and position you know, 23. Um, and uh, it turns out that um, what actually works well, so, so there's no heuristic that's going to be completely consistent. Before, remember, we generate the training pairs to be completely consistent with every monolingual, with our monolingual ranking. But now, um, and I won't go into details, but on the ranking on pairs, this may not be consistent with any monolingual ranking. Um, and we have to do something. So what we do is just rank a Chinese document by averaging across pairs in which it appears. Um, and this kind of gives you, so in this case, we say, oh, well, it should be rank 12 here. Um, and they're kind of, they're more sophisticated variants of this that you might consider. Um, you know, in, in particular, I guess people here must be familiar with this area called rank aggregation, where basically the idea is you see multiple rankings and you want to aggregate across them. So um, my co authors now have new results that rank aggregation, you can kind of aggregate across all the possible rankings on Chinese of this pair. And you can do even better. But this actually tends to work um, already quite a bit better than the monolingual ranking. So what I'm showing you here, I have to be um, uh, honest now, we actually finished this project after we left Microsoft. Um, so there's a problem with that in terms of, you know, well, we want to actually report NDCG, but we can't, right? Because uh, you know, that's all Microsoft internal stuff. Um, so what we did was we took the click through, and now we're reporting um, kind of for the top queries, um, how do we compare with ranking based on click through alone. Um, and you can still do significantly better uh, bilingually than you can monolingually for this, right? So um, basically the idea here, so this is, this. I mean, we have lots of queries, right? So, it shouldn't be surprising that this difference is, is statistically significant. But um, you know, we have, I don't know, 10 or 20,000 uh, queries to test on. And, uh, and you know, so we can actually get uh, a big gain by actually combining these two. Okay. The last thing I want to show you is kind of what queries are 
most improved. Um, again, kind of qual the qualitative version of this. Um, obviously, British history and Salmonella, I picked them for a reason. Um, political cartoons actually is one thing that uh, might be a bit controversial, but it turns out to be um, one of the most improved Chinese queries. Um, turns out that if you can search for English political cartoons, it's actually that helps you a lot in finding political cartoons in Chinese. Um, just for fun, we actually tried this in the opposite way. Right? We tried to rank English. And it turns out that, um, so for any of you guys that, not that I'm advocating this, but for any of you guys that actually do watch pirated TV, you'll notice that uh, almost all of the English sites are actually, the best English sites for pirated TV are actually kind of routed through China. Um, and, uh, and so it turns out that this is actually the number one best improved English query is uh, if you search for free online TV uh, and you know the, the, the actual uh, kind of best, best query is this. So the others are, are less interesting except perhaps for uh, Aniston. Um, it turns out uh, gen like right at least during the kind of period we sampled the query log, uh, Friends was hugely popular in China. Um, and Jennifer Aniston was also very popular. And um, the, her Chinese name doesn't have her first name. So this is just uh, Anna Sidun, um, and, uh, which is her you know, transliteration of her last name. And basically, uh, the idea there is just that um, if you kind of maybe, you know, in English, if you forgot her first name, oh, is it Jennifer Aniston or Jessica Aniston, and you just search for Aniston, which people do do, um, you can actually get a significant uh, performance increase by um, kind of looking at the Chinese uh, results. Okay, so I guess I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. So there's a lot of things that um, I'm, I'm interested in. I showed you guys these two, but all of them kind of fall into this idea of um, building robust models across multiple domains. So uh, one um, that kind of came up a little bit is how can we characterize kind of theoretically when the algorithms like the ones I described here work well? Uh, can I say, and this also I did uh, work with um, uh, Shai Ben David and Kobe Kramer and Jen Wortman and Alex Kuleza. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm continuing this work um, as well now uh, with, with other people. But I think that you know, it's kind of very interesting to consider when uh, you know, I, I give you two distributions, kind of what conditions on, this dis on these distributions do I need such that an, ad a, an algorithm which kind of learns on one and observes nothing about the other does well, uh, or observes a few instances of the other does well, right? Um, the second, and actually I'm going to talk about this Friday, I don't want to compel you guys to come, but I'm going to talk to the NLP group about using some of these techniques in machine translation. Um, so it turns out, uh, just at a high level, um, kind of there are all these different components to machine translation, and they're trained on all different domains. Might not be the, these domains might not be comparable to the ones you want to translate. And again, like there's this idea of can I can I um, use all of these different uh, components together to train a better joint model on the domain I care about. Um, so other things that I'm interested in kind of fall under the general rubric of, kind of I don't know what I'll call this, natural supervision. So, for example, there's been recent work on uh, face and object recognition that's really good. But now if I know kind of the syntactic structure, can I recognize verbs? So, for example, here's a picture of the Yankees pitcher who won the World Series holding up his World Series trophy. Can I look at a bunch of examples of the verb holding, and if I knew the nouns, could I uh, you know, learn something about holding um, in general? Uh, and kind of another thing that I'm interested in that I think you know, people on here have already done uh, good work on, but I think there's still a lot of interesting kind of depth in this area is can I build a model for search or ads on, let's say, you know, serving ads on the Wall Street Journal, and now I want to serve ads on WordPress or something, right? Um, like, can, uh, can you do this with, without any labeled data or you know, without any click-through on a new blog? Can I serve the right ads, right? And, uh, and you know, sort of questions in this vein. Okay, 
So that's it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what's the influence of the number of initial pivots when you were showing books and, and DVDs and uh, electronics? You yeah. had various number of initial pivots, I suppose. Was yeah, uh, it turns out that just more is better, always. Um, and was the case that, I don't know, you had a lot more pivots like between electronics and, and DVDs? And uh, Kitchen of Wines? Oh, I see. Yeah, you're right. You can, you're, you're right about that. You can actually construct more if the domains are closer. That is true. Um, and in practice, we always use the same number. We always use 2,000. Yeah. Project on the same. That's right. But, but that, that is a good question. Um, you can construct more for more similar domains. And we haven't done that experiment. I suspect that. Um, you would be able to do better. Part of the thing is just like the amount of vocabulary overlap really helps you. Um, so even with the same number of pivots, you can get, I guess, obviously better results. Have you thought about generalizing this without looking at the second domain? Well, OK. In other words, like building some sort of finding ways to make your model more general. I don't know. Have you thought of, in other words, could you improve your performance on kitchens without ever applying so that I can look at it during the training phase? That, I mean, I, I guess I haven't come up with any good ideas for that. In, in some sense, that, like, in general, uh, seems very hard, right? Like, I mean, uh, consider not knowing anything about the reviews that you want, right? So you, if you make some assumption about, like, you know, oh, I guess common words in books are, are more appropriate, but. The same way. Your pivot space. For example, in your in your model, you assume that something, some really powerful word like uh, you know, page turner. Let's just say that was a great thing. You assume that that's you're, you're going to learn how to predict that rather than actually use it. And you might assume that the general things that help you predict that would still help you predict it in the next model. Yeah. So you know, I, I actually be there, and you're fine. I, I I guess you're right. Although that still doesn't. Um, that still depends on you kind of. Uh, knowing that um, you know uh, a breeze is equivalent to page turner, kind of when you see it, right? I would say maybe. Okay, I guess my thought would be something that on the lines of, well, anything that I find that's really super strong in my in my training corpus, I shouldn't trust it. I should move one step away from it and use and use the things that predict it, and hope that those things, my buzzing sort of my space for those really strong mm -hmm. predictors, that I'll do better when I get the next one because uh, I just assume that some fraction of my really yeah. strong things. Obviously, like great buy is probably still true. You know, it maybe doesn't show up as more, much in one as the other. I, mean, I see. Yeah. So, so okay. So one one variant of that is just to ignore the kitchen appliances data and run completely this exact algorithm just only with books. Right. That's what I was wondering. Right. If you did. And yeah, we did do that, um, and it does help a little bit, but it's not nearly. I mean, uh, like if you think about the intuition of oh, I've just never seen this word before, right? Um, so you still wouldn't be able to use the words you hadn't seen. Right. And, and that, those turn out to be... The would be more helpful. Like your I example. If, if in, turn, in fact, it turned out that I was always a, a positive word, or generally tend to be a positive word, well, that's still going to show up in your new corpus. Right. Uh, and, you, and you can still be okay if you trusted it. So if you always tend to trust, you know, if you can tend to trust things that were less... I'm thinking about, it, in particular, one of the things that we did spam filtering stuff. Yeah. And we had exactly this problem where since what spammers do is they start stop using the words that you found most powerful. And we never did this kind of thing. I mean, obviously, they, they stopped using Viagra. Uh, and the model eventually compensates by looking for other things like, you know, best price and things like that that are lots of exclamation points. Or, um, yeah, I mean, I guess, like, it would be nice to build a gen more generalizable model to begin with without having to see the future. Right. I mean, in this kind of so, I, I, let me let me actually say something to that. Uh, you can act, there are actually algorithms which are online, right? Even in the unsupervised case, right? So these are kind of boot, bootstrapping algorithms where you see a new example, and you kind of absorb the new vocabulary from that example as you learn, right? And you kind of fuzz out over that, 
right? So you, you can, I mean, in, in, I guess in, in your example, um, like I, I see, uh, um, well, okay, so suppose I see, you know, um, a breeze just immediately. Then you can say, well, I've never seen a breeze before, but like I fuzz it out kind of upon seeing it, right? So I can't get this one right, but next time I see it, I kind of absorb that in an online fashion. Um, and in that sense, you can, um, you can be adaptable. I guess spam is particularly tricky, right? Because it really is an adversarial situation. Um, There's a limit to adversarial because there's still a back of human has to read the final uh, Yes and no, right? Because the spammers will read mail too and mark their own messages as not spam, right? Yeah. Access to the, to the rating system, if you want. In fact, we kind of like can assume unless they don't have access to it, the way we find people to do their mail. The rating system? Oh, you actually pay people to do. We don't. We get volunteers, but the volunteers are people who have been using Hotmail for some time. So, so essentially, you can assume your ratings are good. So you can detect when a spammer is using Hotmail? Well, you did, the spammers don't use it enough. They, they can't get enough tracks. Try. So let's just assume for the moment the ratings are fine. Mm -hmm. So what they can do is detect whether their mail is currently categorized as like spam or not. Right, and try to alter it. So but, but I'm saying, like, at least, I mean, this is, this is via, you should take this with a grain of salt, but this is via kind of conversations with people at Yahoo. My impression is that actually most people on Yahoo Mail are spammers. Um, and so you have to have some way of kind of cleaning up your labels just initially, right? So, like, every spammer, I mean, he, he was describing the problem this way. Like, spammer sends out a mail. I mean, botnet sends out a mail, right? To, including a lot of Yahoo addresses that he owns, right? And he automatically logs in and marks that mail as not spam, right? So over and over again, and then he then then he know then eventually he'll send it out, kind of. This is the office of, the, of your talk, I suppose. But just yeah. the way we do it in Hotmail, that we have two separate ways to get to get spam. Mm -hmm. you know, one is the voluntary. I'd like to mark this mail one way or the other. But the primary way is actually something called the feedback loop. We opt in about one percent, the one tenth to one percent of our users. And we send them a, a random sampling of their own mail mm -hmm. once a day, uh, one, one mail for each day, each day that says, hey, please mark this as spam or not. And these oh, are all see. users who've, 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 who we asked to join, and they were already having users for three months or something like that. Right, I see. And, and, and so the, 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 uh, our, from looking at the data, it doesn't look like these users are, have been substantially. Um, I, haven't, I didn't find any value from trying to clean these, the, the users out when I tried to look at the data to find the bad guys. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, I can actually send, it's not my work, but I can send you pointers to kind of... I don't do if, spam anymore. So. If you have, oh well, then, uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, yeah, it's, then it's probably useful. Although there is, it's there is new, um, there is newer kind of in the purely supervised set uh, online algorithms that try to um, basically deal with this by saying, oh well, if I got something wrong, then I should adjust the weights of the features I haven't seen more than the ones I have seen. Right, so oftentimes, you know, you look at these gradient-based methods and you look at a gradient, right, a pure, purely gradient step, right? And, and what that basically means is that all the features are traded equally, right? I mean, it's linear, so you, you linearize the function right around that, that particular point and all the features are, are pure. Right, but you can think of things that are more complicated where you kind of keep track of some, let's say, second-order information online and then you can kind of update even when you see an instance based on kind of what features are there or not. I do think that what, one thing that's interesting to me, I don't have any you know, great ideas yet, is that if I see an instance and I make a prediction about it, right, like if I trust the prediction I made, then can I kind of like say, well, the new feature somehow I can, adjust, I can kind of adjust weights based on my own prediction somehow. So it's really, really hard to ship any kind of online algorithm. Mm -hmm. but, but also, I think there's always the case that there's some split between the th case you're talking about, like the electronics versus the versus the versus the books. Yeah, that's the real world. We never have the same test data that we had in the trade data. It's always the world is always shifting into your feet. Yeah, that's right. So, so if you can make your model generalize better across two domains without having to the second one, then you would have something that probably would just do better in the in the real world when you're talking about uh, you know just the, this normal you know. Categorizing things, well, all of a sudden, you know, somebody shoots somebody else, and all of a sudden, all those articles about him are need to be have something done with, or whatever it is. Yeah. So let me give you, um, actually, let me give you an easier uh, uh, version of of your problem, which is that I think that this this is 
maybe uh, more feasible. Um, but like, I don't actually know what the new domain is. But I know that I'm going to be exposed to it eventually. Right? So like, I really feel that kind of you can't be general, you can't really build an algorithm that's general enough such that, I mean, maybe if you have a lot of kind of problem specific knowledge. But I think in, in general, you know, you build an algorithm and you can't expect to kind of cover a new domain well without ever seeing it, right? Um, and and uh, I, I, I base, but I, I do feel that like your your intuition is right. Like the problem I introduce to be to be more extreme, I introduced kind of an artificial version of this problem, right? Where where like I had electronics data and I knew like oh this is called electronics and I have a lot of it and here it is and go right. But in in practice, of course, you might know well I'm going to go somewhere. I don't know that it's called uh, you know I'm going to have to apply my model somewhere that doesn't look like training. But I don't know it's called electronics and kind of like. I don't know, maybe I'm deploying versions of my model simultaneously, and like I want each of them to be adaptive to the data that it's looking at. Um, but, but kind of, and I'm exposed to it over time. Um, I just wonder, mm -hmm. almost any kind, if there's anything you could generalize from the fact that sometimes, I don't know what people have questions, so. I guess, oh, well, let me, let me say one thing, because I do think this is, this is really interesting, but I feel like, OK. Well, like there's kind of this hot start, cold start, um, if you think about even, you know, all kind of these recommender systems, I guess, is where it's, it's typically, you know, you see a new user and like, can I, do I cold start this user, right? Like, but in, in reality, kind of like, you really can't do well on a user or, 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 or anything like speech, right? Like, we could say, I wish I could build a general speech recognizer, right? That kind of worked on everyone regardless of accent, right? But even I can't do that, right? I mean, even I, if I go and meet someone from, you know, actually the cab driver this morning was from Russia, and you know, after about a minute or two, I could talk to him fine. But, uh, but you know, like it, it just it takes a little while. You got to be exposed to something, I think. Um, I mean, you know, uh, unless unless you can actually get data from kind of all the world's languages offline, then maybe. But you know, again, they're sort of they're new domains being created all the time and this kind of thing. So, anyway. Yeah, well, it's it's really interesting. We'll 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 talk we'll talk later. One uh, simpler problem would be in that respect mm -hmm. is what Michael Gaines was suggesting mm -hmm. is that I mean, could you actually use data information you get from you you have a lot of books and then now you have the DVDs mm -hmm. and then you have the electronics and. Can you learn from that how to apply the book data for a new domain? Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, can you learn from, so you have a distribution from which you have a lot of data that's mm -hmm. annotated, and you have these other distributions from uh, which you have just yeah. tiny data, right. but you can still learn of what's general enough in right. my initial distribution that I could use on any new domain. Yeah, just like if I go to a new country, Maybe people understand English differently in different languages. I'm going to know right. that using big expressive hand gestures makes people know if I'm right. happy or sad. Or I figure it out the other way around. I look at somebody and say, I've learned over time that I can't, if I can't understand the words, yeah, I'll yeah. Get a facial expression. So, so this is actually, um, th you're right, this is, this is interesting. Um, I don't think it'll get at the whole problem, but, uh, but this is a studied problem in, in machine learning. It's called multitask learning. Right? So basically, kind of if you have labeled data from electronics, Right, um, and you want to say, well, I don't know, you know, kind of where I'm, when I'm going to see my next domain, but I know this is a new domain. Now, kind of learn something that kind of I expect to generalize to my next problem. Exactly. I was assuming um, there'd be some things in books or something that are you could figure out from looking at different domains, or you maybe just assume right. anything that's really high value is probably special specific to my domain. That's right. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. And, that's right. That's right. So, uh, so I think. Um, That you had. Christian. You might just automatically distrust features that are too strong and try to generalize into features that are that are that are popular but not strong. And that yeah. Just, you know, that kind of that, that kind of actually, heuristic actually unfortunately tends not to work well. I never tried that, but again on the span corpus, the good yeah. mail, you have this problem, you learn the names, but if you have a small enough yeah, set, right. the names of the people 
who are right. who, who are in your yeah. training yeah. set, and they never show up in your test set, and, and and they just we just make your model worse. But there's no we never tried to remove them because we can well not just got a lot more users. Well, when you had only a hundred users say that each of those people's last name was just a phenomenal feature to me in the Yeah, yeah. Um, I I I mean. Uh, so I guess like there is kind of this this set of literature, the multitask literature, but um, but one version of the problem that I don't think is uh, is studied yet is kind of like oh I'm going to I see unlabeled data from one domain and but I know I'm going to test on a different domain right so that could be something right like I know I'm you know uh, I don't know I know I'm I'm going to France and kind of I. I don't know, I watch a video about France, but then I go to Russia, right? Like something like this. I don't know what the, the real world analogy is, but, uh, but yeah, I, 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 agree, I agree with that. That is, that is interesting. I mean, the, there's kind of like, the, there's this whole subfield, you know, of, of machine learning, kind of cottage industry called transfer learning, where basically, transfer learning, um, where basically the idea is kind of, it kind of absorbs everything I did and also, uh, you know, um, where you actually do see some labels as well. Uh, and I think the case where you start to see labels, you start to learn some things. But, and, and you're right, I, you would like to learn kind of what's, what from books is general, right? That is true. Um, and, you, you know, kind of uh, regardless of where you're going, there's kind of some core of uh, what does it mean to be sentiment. Um, Expect you to ever do as well as actually being able to look at the appliances data first, but then hope the question would be, could you do better than you would if you just started with? Yeah, 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 I think that's right. It turns out that the that the heuristics actually that you might suspect would work, at least in all the problems I've looked at, don't work so well. Um, like basically, you know, for example, the one you suggested, right, is one of the first ones you think of. Like, oh well, I should um, ignore things that are too good on books or you know, if I have unlabeled data from kitchen, I could drop all features which don't appear in kitchen appliances, right? Mm, yeah, yeah, that that kind of always works. No better, maybe sometimes a little worse. Along lines, you did the learning to predict those high value features from what did show in both purposes. Well, except you, yeah, except so except. I know that I know yeah. that, that you know. Right, except that you you now. Some of the, you're still going to have gaps, right? Because you won't the corpus you're actually interested in you've never seen before. Um, but yeah, I think I think uh, all all those things are. I mean, it is it is a fruitful area. Um, I guess I sort of feel like the online setting is probably the most compelling to me because then you can kind of start in the scenario you're talking about and kind of slowly move to one where you actually are seeing data that you really want to deal with. Really yeah. Let's let's end here and then continue the discussion. Sure. We're going to set the record for a more resonant talk, otherwise. Um, and, uh, well, they can they can. Thanks, let's thank again the speaker and the three of us that were Yeah. Oh, that's good. I mean, I. I